Welcome to Web3 with A6 and Z, a show about building the next generation of the internet from the team at A6 and Z Crypto. That includes me, your host, Sonal Choksi. Following a brief summer hiatus since our last episode, which was a very popular conversation on competitive forces, moats for open source and Web3, and a deep dive on network effects, today's episode also goes into how to think about business strategy and competition in a world of open source, both in operations and in practice, as it's a conversation with Uniswap Chief Operating Officer Mary Catherine, aka MC, later. So we also cover organizational structure and collaboration, hiring in Web3, community engagement, how to make decisions on what to innovate on or not, decentralization, DeFi, app store policies, and much, much more. The wide-ranging conversation is based on a live interview and founder Q&A that originally took place at our crypto startup school a few months ago and was edited for podcast form. As a reminder, none of the following should be taken as investment, legal, business, or tax advice. Please see a6nc.com slash disclosures for more important information, including a link to a list of our investments. The conversation begins by asking MC what the biggest surprise for her was in transitioning from TradFi to crypto. That's traditional finance since before joining Uniswap. She was formerly a fintech founder and an investor at Goldman Sachs and spent seven years at BlackRock. Yeah, so first, it's great to be here. I'm so excited to be part of this. I watched every single episode of the Crypto Startup School before I joined Uniswap, so it's cool to be part of the second one. So biggest surprise, I think that as I made the transition, everyone sort of said like, oh, mental models in crypto are very different. And I'd been watching and engaged in crypto for about six years by the time I joined Uniswap. So I oversaw BlackRock's crypto and blockchain activity, which was frankly a tiny part of my actual job there, but it was something I was passionate about and had been committed to since about 2011 when I first bought Bitcoin, first got into the space. So I thought I kind of knew enough about like who the players were, the companies, why certain things hadn't taken off, why DeFi particularly hadn't gotten traction in sort of large capital markets. But I think I underestimated the extent to which some mental models really don't work about why adoption happens. So I want to hear more about that. Like, what are some of those mental models that you think didn't work? Well, I think if you come from... Um, certainly from like bigger companies, you realize they have so much scale and partnering with them might be useful. And one thing that I've kind of come full circle on since I've been at Uniswap is that those partnerships can have kind of limited use. That's one example. The second is that just a lot of go-to-market tactics don't necessarily work because you don't have the same information to be dealing with, right? So we don't know much about our users. We know some things that you might not know in traditional Web2 business, but we don't know a lot of other things. So your whole go-to-market playbook has to be completely different. Your whole notion of like what kinds of endorsements and support and partnerships work has to be quite different. And a lot of that, it's obvious. And I expected some of it, but then living through it, you kind of realize, okay, you know, we do have to think first principles yeah. about a lot of things. So, you know, one of your specialties, I would say, I mean, you have many, but just seeing how you think is business models and business model strategy. So one question, and this is a recurring theme of interest, but I am curious, especially coming from TradFi to crypto, how you think about the competition, Yeah, especially because you are building in the open? I remember when I was deciding to join Uniswap, I talked to Chris Dixon and I asked, like, what are your biggest questions for Uniswap? And he said, defensibility. And you just look at everything that's happening in crypto now and DeFi and NFTs. It still is a big open question. And one thing that I think is also happening among those players who already have some product market fit in an initial product Mm -hmm. is everyone's now trying to get into each other's space because monetization is frankly just a challenge for everyone. If you are committed to building public goods at some layer of your stack, if you are committed to not capturing a lot of user information, it becomes really hard to think about how you can charge people and what you want to charge people for, or if that's even your business model. Right. And the rules of the game that you're playing can change all around you. So many teams aren't trying to build a business. Many teams are trying to release a piece of infrastructure that has a totally different incentive model. And there are different mechanisms and economic incentives available. So I think it's important to really think about for yourself as a founding team, what impact you want to have in the world. And that may sound very obvious, but the spectrum of outcomes is so much wider and more diverse yeah. in crypto than it is in traditional business models. Do you have to game theory that out up front? Yes. Or, yes. Or yes. figure yes. that out as you go? Like how do you yes. sort of translate that? Yes. So I think it's important to game theory that all up front and think like, okay, here's what I hope the product or the protocol we're building does and who I hope uses it. And here's how all these people could come screw us over yeah. because they are anonymous or they just play by different rules. They're there for the vibes. They're there for the vibes. There's a lot of people here yeah. for the vibes. 
A lot of that, we're all, I'm also here for the vibes, but like, yeah. that's not the only thing. So I think that's really important to sort of game theory out in advance. And then having that sort of like long-term perspective of where you want to go and then being a little bit cautious, frankly, yeah. about timing. And I think timing is one of the hardest things in crypto strategy because many people were saying two years ago, it's time to do an app chain. It's time for people to start launching chains. And I think now some of what optimism has achieved with the OP stack, you can see it's maybe better timing now than it was like a year or two years ago for lots of different teams to start thinking about launching chains. Yeah. But the timing is just so critical. Like some companies did it too soon and have already kind of had to shutter that. Okay, a couple more questions probing more on strategy and moats. So if you were to fill in the blanks, like blank is the moat. People often will fill that blank saying community is a moat. How would you fill in that blank for Uniswap? What is the moat for Uniswap? How would you categorize uh, it? I mean, like... We hate the word moat, to be okay, honest. Okay, good. So what would I say? Like, what is the strength of Uniswap? I would say commitment to security. Yeah. And community and simplicity. Right. Are the three things. Okay, so you hate the word moat. I, I have to push because that's what I do. Yeah. How do you think about what is the defensibility of Uniswap? Yeah. Especially because you alluded yes. earlier to that kind of model. I think liquidity is defensibility in DeFi. And that doesn't necessarily mean TVL. TVL is total value total locked. Total value locked, yeah. right? Which is the sort of total capital locked up in a given protocol. And people often mistake that as the most important metric. The B3 of the Uniswap protocol is much more capital efficient. So you don't need as much liquidity to have yeah. the same experience. But if you think about a user, if you are swapping, what's important to you? Price is important to you. Speed is important to you. Choice is important to you. Having an interface that's adjacent and connected to the other things you're going to want to do before and after swapping. So I think that simplicity drives that and liquidity drives price ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. So those are two things that are important. And so part of why I think you have to game theory things out is that the benefit of building open infrastructure is that interoperability can become part of your defensibility, right? Can become part of why people use your protocol if you are the easiest to integrate with. But then you have to think about, well, what actually means that they still need to use you? Right. And in the case of something like swapping, liquidity really, really is part of it. That's so fascinating. So a big theme that's top of mind for the people in this room is the role of community and where that comes into your strategy and how to think about that. And as you know, there's always been this classic model in a lot of tech where your community, your core community, they used to have this phrase, I forgot who coined it, I think it was Jeff Moore, crossing the chasm, this idea that you have your early adopters and communities and then let other people in. You guys work with institutions, you have early community, like DGENs who are just hanging out, having fun. There's yeah. just a range of people to deal with here. So A, how do you think about the diversity of the community, nurturing the community, and then B, is community part of the business strategy and how does that yeah. play out? Yeah, it's different depending on the stage of where you are. Where we are now, I think being a steward of our community is imperative. Mm -hmm. So we're now 100 people. We require every person to go to an Ethereum conference at some point in their first mm -hmm. year because I think it's just really important that they be around all the people who have like an emotional connection to Uniswap. Yeah, and they do and have a very emotional connection. They do, connection. right? People come up to you and they're like, oh my gosh, I got the airdrop or whatever. And so we think that's really important and it's important to be present in our Discord and Reddit and Twitter. We honestly don't do like any events. You can waste so much time and energy yeah. in the things that are like low ROI and like, yep. right? And that don't really make an impact. Yeah. And we still just believe that like building new things that our users want is the best way to be a right. student of our community. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, it's funny you mentioned the thing about events because the common motion in DevRel or developer relations is to do a lot of events. And it's great that you talked about those being kind of lower ROI yeah. in terms of the payoffs. But how do you hear from the users directly? Or do you even source their feedback to the product? Yeah, we do. The way that we really serve Wallet is a good example. Like in Discord, we solicit feedback and input all the time. We also are really conscious, you know, one thing that's great about a lot of crypto products is you're instantly global. You're not like launching new markets. Yeah. And so we try to do things like different time zones or do things in different languages. I so never thought about that. Audiences. That's so interesting. Yeah. So community is critical and important, but you can prioritize it and continue to grow it and foster it without necessarily doing some of the obvious motions to do that. Having said that, there's a balance. In 2021, every time I went to a conference, someone was like, oh my God, I've never met a human from Uniswap before. And yeah. then Hayden, <laughs> at the very beginning in 2018, and then I haven't seen anybody since then. So you still have to show up a little bit, right? right, right. But yeah, I think you can do it pretty efficiently. That's great. Okay, in your role as CEO, you oversee talent. That includes hiring, culture. You oversee go-to-market, comms, finance. That's a lot. And a lot of the people listening are building companies who don't oversee all of that, but how do you now translate that into, okay, now how do I hire? How do I, yeah. you know, do X? How do I recruit, et cetera? Like, how does that play out for you? I think that's the biggest challenge. I and mean, this is hard for any startup is 
figuring out how you hire people who have the right mix of experience and like open-mindedness yeah. and excitement about what you're actually building. And we're also in an interesting point in crypto where Uniswap is a great example. Like 60% of self-custody wallets that have swapped use Uniswap, use the Uniswap interface, not just the Uniswap protocol. So we have pretty high penetration in the existing community, of the existing user base. So as we're trying to think about how do we grow, yes, we need talent and leaders and everyone on the team to understand our crypto native users and to be very sensitive to like the nuance of what is important, what isn't important, why they use us in the first place, how we are respectful and loyal to that. But then also to be creative about how we grow from here. I think it's particularly challenging in like BD or partnerships or things that are sort of user facing. One example from this morning, you know, we often will have big brands excited to like put us in a press release and we say no almost all the time. And it's so heartbreaking because it takes a lot of trust for someone to be willing to partner right. with, you know, and somebody's trying to disrupt them. But if we don't have confidence that their technology is something we would endorse, we're not going to be part of something like that. And then trying to just suss out and interviewing people. We do do a values interview. One of our values is build to last. Oh, I think that's really important in crypto, particularly now that people have a security mindset, building for the long term kind of mindset. Yeah. So we try to do it in how we interview people. You know, we do a lot of case studies also, like how would you think about launching this, launching that? But I think people kind of feel it when they meet our team. Like yeah. our office is bright pink and full of unicorns, literally. And so if people don't come and realize that that's what we're here for, then yeah. they're not interested anyway. Totally. Actually, just to probe on that a little bit more, it's kind of funny that you mentioned that the office is full of unicorns because I remember the first time I met Hayden, you know, the founder of Uniswap, he was wearing a unicorn tie because it was inspired from the unicorn tapestries, which I think are up in New York at the Cloisters. I can't yeah. remember where they are, but I think they're up there. And it's kind of interesting because he's bringing together in a way art, technology, you know, this culture that you're bringing together in your company, which is probably one of the more scaled crypto companies you are bringing together, especially in the functions you oversee, like a lot of diverse groups. And then you're also interfacing and working with engineering and other folks. So I'd love to hear also how your teams think about working with those teams and if there are any culture clashes or if there are any things you have to do to bridge the groups or how you think about all that. Yeah. So just a little bit of context on what our team and company look like. So Hayden Adams started Uniswap as a project funded by the Ethereum Foundation in 2018. He wasn't trying to build a company, which I think is part of the success of the protocol. He was trying to build something that embodied the values of Ethereum. Yeah. And then funded by 16Z, he hired a couple people, in part because he felt like grant funding wasn't quite enough to build a really resilient protocol and ultimately products on top of it. I joined when Uniswap was about 10 people okay. in 2021. And when I joined, there was one product person, one designer, four engineers, two lawyers, and me. Lawyers are kind of early hires in crypto startups, as you guys probably know, relative to other startups. And I'm actually a lawyer by training, which is part of why I really love oh, crypto. I didn't know that. Yeah. It's the intersection of so many different disciplines. Yeah, totally. So when I joined, there already had been these days where the Uniswap protocol had done more volume than Coinbase and certainly did more trading volume in crypto to crypto swapping relative to Coinbase versus Coinbase's overall total volume. And the team was tiny. Since then, we've built out a lot of the functions and pieces of a company that didn't exist before because Hayden's vision, what I was excited to sign on for, was that we should build applications on top of the protocol. That for the protocol to really grow and be successful and be resilient over time, you needed to have applications on top of it that make it useful. And so that's what our company's been doing since then, is building those products. We've launched a wallet, an NFT marketplace, right. and then improving our web app. So sometimes it can feel like, well, the headline number, the vanity metric that many people look at when they think about Uniswap is volume on the protocol. And it can feel like that hasn't changed that much since we built an actual company around it. But a lot of it has been building the foundation for these other new products. I wanted to give that context. That's super helpful. And so when we're talking about these teams, why do we have any of these teams in the first place, Right. It was a choice to start to build a company and build applications because the hope was that that would magnify the impact that we could have in general in DeFi and that the protocols shouldn't actually need our team and our company. So given that context, then how do all those teams connect together and deal with all that collaboration across the groups? Well, DeFi is truly, truly multidisciplinary. And so everyone has to be able to tolerate each other being in the room. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that you're looking for permission from a different team, Right permission for legal to sign off on something or permission for like a PM to say, yes, this is on our roadmap. So we operate in just sort of small pods. Everything has to be really, really collaborative. And one thing that was really important early on was to write down some of our principles around open source development. 
Why are we committed to open source? What does that mean? When do we build in the open? When do we not build in the open? And those aren't uniformly applied across everything that we build. So for right. example, the wallet we didn't build in public, but we did open source. And NFT marketplace we built in public. So they're just kind of trade-offs specific to each thing. Mm -hmm. But writing all of that down was really important because we're never going to hire someone who's going to say, why can't we make a future protocol proprietary? That's right. contrary to the entire ethos, right? But it was very helpful to have some of that stuff encoded so people kind of know how to interact with each other. The last thing I should say about the oh, importance of that. how we get things done is that because we are pretty collaborative, it's very helpful to have a lot of people in person. So 70% of the company lives in New York City and about half the team is there every single day. So most people are there about three days a week and that helps us move fast. So you mentioned PMs. You just kind of quickly drop that in. Do you guys actually have product managers? Because that's one thing I really yeah. am curious about for how people are going to grow and scale their companies. Does that work in a crypto company? For those that don't know this history, there's always been this love-hate relationship in tech with the role of product managers between engineers and designers and, you know, sales and community. And Google famously, like, hired a bunch, fired a bunch, and then kind of went back to the basics. So I'm yep. curious how you guys are thinking about that. Yes. So for a few months, we've entertained the traditional technology company model of we have a PM and that PM is at the center of decisions. We do not do that anymore. We still have PMs and they are wonderful and critical to driving work forward. Yeah. But what we found is that our new ideas come either from deeply technical perspectives mm -hmm. or very user focused perspectives that are coming often from our design team or the market facing like BD go to market teams. Yeah. So one end of the spectrum, there's this thing we release called permit to that basically just allows you to now interact with a smart contract and permit it once and interacting with it. Something like that comes typically from an engineer. Oh, okay. Or we have now a lot of ideas around how we can bring the protocol to people around payments and mm -hmm. FX. And that is largely coming from people who are out talking to partners right. or talking to users all the time. And so I still think you still need PMs to bring everything together. But because there's such deep knowledge, you need to either meet a user need or change market structure yeah. in the case of DeFi. Yeah. And then how do you kind of get things done? Because obviously you said the PMs are there to help drive things forward. But you also said earlier, there's a super collaborative. Everyone has to be involved given the ethos. Yeah. It feels like those are two very fundamentally at odds. Yeah. Like, how do you guys prioritize? Is there a leadership top-down strategy? Is the company bottom-up? How do you sort of structure that, like, innovation yeah. process, I guess? Each quarter, we've done it a tiny bit differently, depending on where we were in the roadmap for the company. Mm -hmm. But it's a bit of each. So, again, when I joined, it was 10 people. All 10 people sat together and yeah. thought, well, what are the things that we want to build next? What do we think are the gaps to driving more growth and adoption? Like, where is our web app falling behind? How do we think about obvious competitors to us, like aggregators, wallets, things like that. Now what we do is we have sort of bottoms up brainstorms in each pod. And then Hayden, Cal, who runs design, and I, and our head of engineering, will just sit together with the PMs and land on that. Yeah. So it's kind of a mix, to be honest. Got it. Okay. You don't oversee engineering, but I am curious, because a lot of the builders in this room are not all engineers, how you think about smart contract development from a non-engineer's perspective. Yeah. Have you had to shift any mental models there? Were there any surprises that you sort of came to when you first came to the world of smart contract development? It feels very unlike anything in TradFi. Yes, definitely. I mean, that's part of what got me passionate about crypto in the first place, mm -hmm. is like having spent my career as an investor, wanting to change the financial system. I started a fintech company, realized fintech doesn't really change things that much. It's sort of right. like a layer on top that like smart contracts is what excites me so much. However, building smart contracts, as many people in the room probably know, is a different way of working than building like a typical consumer app or a consumer product. And so making sure that our wallet team operates very differently from like our protocols team because they are having to anticipate issues at different points. Smart contracts must be safe. That sounds obvious, but need to be audited. It's just being really, really security minded yeah. and security oriented. It's like we literally do not move fast and break things, yeah. right? right? Yeah. Built to last is one of our values. Right. But our wallet team then has to like get to market quickly, get user feedback. And so you do need to have those different ways of operating. Okay, I'm going to go a little lightning round to you questions. So regulation, maybe this yeah. is not a lightning round answer, but definitely want to hear anything that's top of mind for you on the topic yeah. of regulation. And we can talk about what's going on in the current financial system as well at the end, but thoughts on regulation? Well, I think right now every crypto company needs to be really, really hard to kill. And it's a bummer to be thinking about regulation a lot in the early days of trying yeah. to just build a product or build a smart contract protocol and get people to use it. I really do think that if you're building something that people will use, 
then you should be confident in the long term. That's how I think about it for Uniswap. Like if we're building something that is an improvement on current markets, we're building something that's useful for people, yeah. then like that over the long term. But it's specific to every company, whether it makes sense to spend time on yeah. policy and regulation. We spend a lot of time on it because we think that the promise of anybody being able to create a market is kind of radical in the long term capital formation and policy speak, the ability for anybody to be able to raise capital is part of the promise of automated market makers and of DeFi, but it's tricky to navigate how that fits into today's rules. Right. But basically my main takeaway on interacting around financial regulation for a long time now is that you cannot improve today's system by adapting to today's rules. And if we have new rails, we need new rules. Uh -huh. And so trying to kind of fit what you're building into the way the rules are, I actually don't think is a winning strategy. Uh -huh. uh, that doesn't mean you should break them, but it means you should, to the extent that what you're building requires some policy shifts, like very proactively try to seek them. I know I said I'd ask you about the current banking situation. Curious your thoughts on that. I mean, look, it's been a really crazy week in TradFi and banking. And nothing proves the importance of DeFi and resilient protocols more than like the challenge of balance sheets. But for people who come from finance, one of the things I often say is like, imagine if you can have financial activity without relying on balance sheets or the notion that you can have a market without having a market maker. If people have a background in finance, they realize that's kind of mind blowing. And I think just seeing what happened with SCB is a concrete example of what we mean when we say you want to reduce trust or eliminate trust. Sometimes trust can mean a lot of different things and can be confusing and it's easy to argue, what do you mean? You still have to trust a protocol if you're interacting with it. Yeah. But you don't have to trust static reporting. <laughs> yeah. That is ultimately what you're relying on to know that you can access your money. So the you Uniswap know, protocol did record volume of over $11 billion in volume in that 24-hour period. And it's crazy when you come from an environment where times of increased volume like that change the operational environment. You right. can feel it if you're on yeah. the trading floor wow. and you're trading 10 times what you're used to. You feel it in the energy. And in that case, the protocol operates independently and autonomously. Every single person who'd ever built it was probably asleep when a lot of that was happening. So that, I think, just illustrates the importance of these durable new foundation that DeFi represents. But it's, again, just like a really unfortunate time. My heart goes out to everybody who was stressed out over the weekend and yeah. uncertain what was going to happen. Me too. And I do think it's really interesting because until now, a lot of the people that have really fast adopted crypto have been in countries and places where the financial system hasn't been secure. So not great that it's happening, but great that people are understanding the vulnerabilities in the system, the lack of resilience that so many of us have been thinking about for a long time, especially those that went through the 2008 financial crisis. And the whole new generation that doesn't even have a memory of that or any funds and banks. So feeling that vulnerability and knowing that what you guys are building is kind of exciting to hear that so many people came to Uniswap in that time. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah. My first week work, I think, was when Lehman crashed and I was working on a trading floor at the time. Yeah. And another crypto founder was asking me over the weekend, it was just what it felt like. And I was like, no, this is actually not what it felt like. Like it was like much bigger and much more dramatic for those people who remember. But it is, to your point, a powerful reminder of why it is so important to have and the promise of having like interoperable, resilient, audible code yeah. at the core of the financial system is really exciting. That's super exciting. So one of the talks that Tim Ruffbard and our head of research gave yesterday talked a lot about how to think about helping people make the case for crypto. How do you make the case as someone, again, who talks a lot to TradFi, coming yourself from TradFi to, like, what's the moment that you think they'll get it? What kind of things do you say to convince them, advocate, especially when you start hiring more people who are only coming from traditional backgrounds yep. and don't even know what we're talking about. How do you think about convincing people to come into this yep. space? Yep, yep. Honestly, right now, I don't try to convince anybody. Maybe that's a no. disappointing answer, but I think right now we're not trying to convince a lot of people. Instead, I'm trying to spend, we're trying to spend all of our energy building it so you don't have to use as many words to convince that's somebody. That's great. So yeah. like what I did, so my extended family is from eight different states, all different industries. Nobody works in tech. Nobody works in finance. Very different levels of education. And so over Thanksgiving, I just did a demo of Uniswap, our new wallet, and OpenSea. And everyone was like, wait, I keep my account. My account is mine. My assets are mine. Like, you can see it if you just do those demos of a couple of these products. Yeah. And I think that clicks with people for different reasons, either because they care about privacy or because they care about lock-in and they don't like and respect the companies they think own their data. So different things resonate with different people. And I find the most helpful thing is just to show people. Show versus tell. That yeah. is a great note for us to end on. We will now open it up to questions from the audience. Hi, MC. Hi. Um, 
quick question for you. You talked a little bit about having to shift business models just given the lack of metrics in Web3. What are the metrics that you wish oh, you had? Um, given that Uniswap idea. has such a wide top of funnel and and just a variety of mainstream users, DGENs, yeah. et cetera. So what are the things you'd like to track in an ideal world? I just wish that we could communicate with someone if they churn. That's the main thing. Mm. It's not like even knowing data about them. Yeah. So it's not so much that we want to start collecting information. We want to think about ways to communicate with users mm -hmm. uh, without having to have all their information. So you could think about like messaging through wallets. But that's the main thing. It's just as you look at your funnel, if someone's not there anymore, you have very limited ability to understand mm -hmm. where they came from in the first place and then how you can reach them again. Awesome. Actually, just one quick note. You were saying that you want to communicate so you can understand the churn as a metric to understand. But are there other metrics that you guys also use to mm. measure the success? Because you mentioned TVL was not a good one, but like what yeah. else is there that you yeah, yeah, yeah. use? I think price is important. Mm -hmm. Slippage is important sort of relative to other trading protocols. We want to be able to say you can get competitive, if not the best prices, using our Uniswap web app. Mm -hmm. So how can we help make that possible? Performance in the wallet. Wallets are shockingly on performance. <laughs> it's like different sort of metrics of speed and performance in the app itself. We still have funnel metrics. We still have cohorts and the kinds of stuff that you would look at sure. for a normal uh -huh. consumer app. It's just that you can do less with them because you can yeah. interact with and contact your users. Yeah. Right. Makes total sense. Thanks. Thanks. Hi. Thanks for the talk. We know that the Uniswap wallet app has kind of been stuck in test flight. Yes. I was wondering if you could talk about Uniswap's experience navigating app store policies, what you guys are doing to try to get approved by the app store, et cetera. Yeah. So A16Z has been an amazing helper on this. I think this is an area where investors who've seen many, many more companies go through it. It's very helpful. So even though we have plenty of people on our team now who've been through App Store approval many times, A16Z is on the front lines of seeing how they're treating Web3 companies. And so it can kind of give you more current information and perspective. I'm actually really happy with how it's turned down in the sense of like, I think it was good for us to go test flight first. I think that our instinct, having started, the core of the team started by launching a protocol where you release it right away to the whole world. Our instinct was like a launch is just a launch, like just go GA right away generally and available. generally available yeah. right away. And it's an example of the difference in launching protocols versus launching products or a consumer app. And this has given us good user feedback and a good way to like reward questions around community, reward existing users. What I wish we could have done differently is... We sort of built a relationship with them, but we built a relationship just with the people who were doing our actual approval. And we should have probably spent time in advance, and maybe some of you should start doing this too. We spent time in advance in partnership with A16Z, like figuring out who do we need to meet and explain to them why we are exactly the app they should be letting in the app store. If they're worried about their brand and they're worried about risk and they're worried about people losing their money, like a self-custody wallet from the most trusted name in DeFi that's thinking about this is exactly who they should be approving. And it seems like they aren't necessarily as deep in it and it's not a priority area or high growth area from their perspective. So I guess like to just say there's no substitute for starting to build some human relationships. That makes sense. Thanks. One more question. Let's say you all do get approved. How much would you all kind of push the envelope on App Store fees? So would you all offer the opportunity to buy? What about swap fees? That sort of thing. Yeah. So when you say push the envelope, so far there's no Apple take rate on swapping or fiat on ramp, much like they don't take 30% of your Robinhood trade, mm -hmm. right? I mean, Robinhood trading is free, but you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. more analogous to like a brokerage in that sense than it is to like an in-game item. Different perspective on the similar question though is one thing we're really excited about is the opportunity for third-party app stores. So yeah. you may have seen in Europe, now Apple's going to have to allow like side loading or third-party app stores. And that's an area that we're really excited about. And we'd love to collaborate with other Web3 companies that want to help make that possible. Does that mean building like a separate version of the app that has kind of more full-featured functionality and that can be side loaded by users independently? I don't think anyone knows how the app stores themselves okay. are going to play out. Like nobody yet knows what the infrastructure for that app store is, whether it's like same app, but you have some features that are hidden in the one that's approved by the Apple App Store and others, we're not sure. But I guess we're thinking about it kind of similarly to Android, just like you have slightly different functionality on different platforms as it is. What I meant by the App Store, though, is we're excited about helping contribute to that App Store, like not just release our own app through it, but think about what that would look like. I could decentralize. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Decentralized Truly decentralized App Store. App Store. One quick follow up on his question, because you mentioned it, and I think people in this room would want to know more about that. You mentioned how you have to kind of go full launch 
it's generally yeah. available right out at the door. Does that also mean like no MVP? Because one tension, obviously, you mentioned we don't want to move fast and break things, but you don't necessarily want to do the minimal viable yeah. product, but you may not also necessarily want to do the maximum viable product. So at what point do you launch between that spectrum? Yeah, I think it depends entirely on the product. So we obviously test everything internally ourselves. And one thing that we did is, especially as we got bigger, there are many people who are enthusiastic about crypto, but maybe hadn't used it a lot themselves. And so we just started gifting. Hayden gifted tons of people internally, froggy friends, NFTs, and forced them to download the wallet. And then it was like, oh, the CEO sent me an NFT and can tell that I don't have our wallet. Yet, <laughs> yeah, you know. So like we just do a lot, a lot of internal testing. And then for stuff like the wallet, it makes sense to do an MVP. And I think now going forward, we'll do that all the time. On the protocols, you can obviously do things in testnet. I think there kind of comes down to what you're building, whether you're building in the open or not. Yeah. Great. Hi. Thank you for sharing your experiences. There's new products that Uniswap has been building, like the NFT trading, the wallet. So how do you evaluate? It's kind of a trade-off between working on your core product and expanding into these new different areas. So how do you identify interesting areas? Yeah. So identifying interesting areas, the way we thought about anything and everything we wanted to build was what is a barrier to more people ultimately using core protocols, the core protocol, basically, people using the promise of DeFi. And so we thought it was wallets. Wallets are hard to use, either barrier or a natural growth driver that you could attach to and bring those users to you know, swap. And that's why we got into NFTs, because we thought it was a good top of funnel kind of user acquisition strategy is to have people who get into the space because of NFTs, but they ultimately are going to need to swap. And so can you provide both of those things in the same place? And as I mentioned, I think that we didn't do quite enough hard thinking about that to like build a product that really captured that. So I think that's how we think about it. For those that don't know, Mary's role also oversees growth as part of being COO. So Yeah. And I know one of the barriers is also, you know, getting crypto, right? Like on ramping. Yeah. Is that something that Uniswap is considering potentially? So we have a fiat on ramp. We integrated okay. fiat on ramp in December. It's kind of hidden, but we'll be doing a lot in the next month or so to make it more obvious. But basically like what's holding people back and what's bringing people? Yeah. <laughs> and is there, a, does it make sense? Can you do better in either of those areas or just like integrate with those sort of adjacent activities? Thank you. Amazing talk. So much great information. I got a ton of notes already. First off, congratulations on building a phenomenal product. I know as protocol designers, we've used Uniswap as the true north in terms of the documentation, the smart contracts, decisions around open source. So kudos for that. Well, I, I had nothing to do with any of that, actually, but thank you for that. I'm sure, I'm sure you did in some ways. <laughs> My first question, you brought up a really interesting point, which was that when Uniswap first started, the vision actually wasn't a business, but yeah. it was an idea. And I think for a lot of us as founders, we get into this to build ideas. And very quickly, it becomes about building a business. Can you talk a bit about what does that journey look like from going from idea to then business? I think it's a really important and hard question in crypto in particular, because so many of us are excited about the ideas yeah. and you get into the space because you want to make the ideas real and bring them to life. And then when you bring them to life, you have users who expect a certain experience. And so you either have to cultivate an ecosystem of products or you have to be building those things yourself so people can interact with them simply. You don't have to become a business, but the way we thought about it was that Hayden felt like he'd built a great team. The team wanted to stick together, keep working together. We felt like the barriers to broader adoption of the current Uniswap protocol and also its promise was the application layer, was making it easier to use. And so that lent itself very well to a company that then needed to build more products, which meant we needed to hire more people and we want to be self-sustaining. But then you get to make money at some point if you yeah. want to keep paying everybody. So we sort of fell into it a little bit, to be honest, just because of what we wanted to achieve. And so we just talk about being a business as being sustainable. That makes so much sense. It's almost like the business is a critical component yes. to fueling the idea. Exactly. Okay, last question. You know, obviously you're a COO of a massively successful company. I'm, I'm curious, like... My perspective of the role of operations is almost like general purpose problem solver, like legal, go to market, all these different things. Can you talk about what that was like at the smaller scale, like the role of a COO at a small company? I think it's the same. I think general purpose problem solver is true when it's like 10 people or 100 people or many more. So when it was small, it was like, we have no roadmap. <laughs> Should we do a roadmap? So, you know, it was sort of like figuring out the sort of what general gaps, or we had no mission, we had no vision statement, we had no values. It was like helping put some of that foundational stuff in place. And then it was hiring people to run teams that filled those core functions of the company. And 
someone was asking me last night, our head of recruiting was asking me, do I think it's more important that we have senior IC engineers or eng managers? And I was like, I have a totally unsatisfying answer, which is that at our size company, everyone has to be a player coach. And so you have to have both, especially because we have shared infrastructure. Like a lot of the infrastructure we use is open infrastructure, almost everything. You don't need as big a team to do a lot of stuff. And so our company is always probably going to be quite small in terms of headcount, but you still need people who are very experienced or have long-term perspective, at least, if not experience in those leadership roles. So I think it's just the same mindset, regardless of the stage. Cool. Thank you so much. That's great. Just one interesting note in his question about the roadmap. I was wondering, I want to make sure we close this thread on how you think about this, what you said about ideation and coming to product and then how you think about product market fit, because that's yeah. another, I think, gem that was buried in, in his question as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I think product market fit for protocols and products is quite different. And in a protocol, you can kind of program a hypothesis for product market fit into your protocol, right? You have a hypothesis about what kind of incentives or mechanisms you think are going to create that. And I think we have struggled, frankly, with transitioning that mindset to product. So like our NFT marketplace, our hypothesis was people want to be able to buy and sell digital assets in the same place. And our NFT aggregator has very limited adoption because that's just not the right problem to be solving for that kind of a product. So I think it's a little bit different for protocols than it is for products. And I think we're still kind of struggling with that, which kind of gets back to not knowing enough about your users necessarily when you're starting out and deciding to build something. Thanks, MC. Go ahead. Thank you for everything. Echoing everybody, I think Uniswap's decentralized model is a North Star. For many of us, we're building in decentralized commerce for expression and beauty products particularly. And I'd like to ask your best practices or advice as a leader with a no-code background, obviously with deep experience in finance. We as a team have a deep experience in commerce and, and lifestyle industries, but are one of the few in the room that don't write code. So I'd love to get some tips on how to be most effective. One thing I think is really important, which I'm a little embarrassed to say I only did a couple weeks ago when I was on vacation is learn to write a smart contract and deploy a smart contract yourself. You did that on vacation? I did. Yes, <laughs> oh. yes, yes. So, yes, yes. So my partner is also a crypto engineer. And so it was like, you know, you should just learn to do this. And I was like, you're right. I should. Let's do this on vacation. <laughs> and it was really helpful because, for example, transfer from as a function, I was like, oh, I talk about why this is important all the time from a conceptual or systemic sort of perspective, but having to understand that that's a function, a smart contract, what it means. So that's one piece of advice I would say. It may not get you any more respect from engineers, but I think it's important for mindset. And then just be humble about what you know and don't know. You mentioned that Uniswap is the North Star in decentralization. I realize I haven't talked very much about decentralization, but decentralization can mean many different things. One thing that was really hard, but this is not actually the question you asked me, but one thing that was really hard the first year that I was there is that a lot of things would happen in governance. And the whole point is that the team at Uniswap Labs should not be needed for any of those decisions or any of those debates. And Hayden does not struggle with this. He is very self-aware and committed to his original principles of minimized governance, where the roles and responsibility for Uniswap governance are clear and they should be deliberated upon and acted by the community and the token holders. But the company does not vote or participate in governance. No employees in Hayden do not vote or participate in governance. And so sometimes it was very hard to see things happening on Twitter or people who you are friends with in the community also excited about, and we couldn't participate. So I think just thinking in advance about what that's going to look and feel like for you as humans and your team and what you can enshrine, how you can like institutionalize your intentions in a way that if you cannot be part of that, and that's part of the point, those people who are now part of your community have enough information about what your intentions were that you can feel good about how those dialogues and debates happen without you. It's very helpful. We're actually building the voting tool as we speak. So oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Hey, MC. Excellent talk and well moderated as well. Can you talk about a time where perhaps you came in, you joined the team of 10, they're ready, had product market fit, they're ready, a great team. But can you talk about a time where you had something specific in mind for the team, like a direction, and maybe there was a little bit of resistance. Maybe this was something that yeah. the team wasn't quite ready for or they thought differently. And then perhaps there was a way that you're able to bring the team together and have like a new direction. Can you talk about how you navigated that? Can you talk about how that went? Yeah. So an ongoing one that I think is hard for most teams in DeFi is 
most of the world's capital. So if we want to unlock universal ownership and exchange, that means get more users and individuals or enterprises. It also means get more capital. And if most of the world's capital is locked, so to speak, or gatekept by institutions that require identity and require knowing who you are, that's potentially a huge barrier to adoption. And I think one of the hardest things to figure out is like, when is it a good use of our time to help figure out how to break that? Mm. And which institutions are guardians of all that capital? We want to work with us productively. So when I first joined, I would talk about this in like very abstract terms. Here's how big this market is, or here's how big the foreign exchange market is. Here's how big the fixed income market is. Look at all this money in the world. They care about KYC and AML, and we need to figure out a solution to that. And then over time, you realize that that's contrary to the ideals and the principles of permissionless financial infrastructure. And I knew that. I wasn't trying to suggest that we should change anything at Uniswap, but I was rather saying, let's figure out how we get these organizations that have so much capital to start using the Uniswap protocol, either swapping and buying and selling crypto or using our infrastructure for other forms of money. And I think that that's an example of timing, right? Where I think the timing was too soon, two years ago. Right now, it may seem like Traditional financial institutions don't have any interest in DeFi. I actually think this is a much, much better time, right? Because nobody wants just a press release. And instead, you can start to think about, well, okay, which pieces of the landscape are incentivized to take advantage of the benefits of crypto and smart contracts? So if someone is benefiting from time to settle, they don't really care about disrupting that process and using smart contracts. If someone is benefiting from customer lock-in, they don't really care either. So trying to think about who are players who have big pools of capital that would benefit from the benefits of like instant settlement, of more transparency, of lower cost transactions, access. And so we've just done a couple of different things. How we kind of broke through this is one member of our research team and I had a thesis that foreign exchange on the Uniswap protocol could be a really good use case. And so we wrote a little research paper just kind of explaining how and why would this make for a better institutional foreign exchange market, retail foreign exchange market, and remittance market. And it was kind of high level. But it forced us to dive into our assumptions and try to figure out, okay, well, how would we actually make this useful? Which users are underserved and don't have access through banks or money transfer operators today? So I guess that's the biggest example. We haven't cracked it. And what have I done? I've just like tried to question my own assumptions over and over, try to think about which partners are potentially open to the way we see the world, and then really try to dive in and do some research on it. And I think that we now have a couple ideas around that that are true to our values in DeFi but that can open up what we do to a lot more people. That's great. Was part of your question also about how to navigate that internally? Oh, yeah. So I spent just tons of time talking to everybody about why I cared about our mission. Like, it was easier because it was 10 people. I didn't have to sort of give a talk to the whole company. But I just had long lunches and dinners with every single person there to explain why changing the financial system in DeFi is something that I was passionate about. And so I think I have their trust that my intentions are the same. So if I use like a word or an acronym that triggers people, they're not blaming me or they'll tell me and I'll stop using it. But it's honestly kind of hard in hiring people who come from TradFi because we make assumptions about the way the world is. And the whole point is we want the world to be different. Thank you so much. Thank you. And just for those in the room who don't know the acronyms that MC mentioned with KYC, Know Your Customer, AML, Anti-Money Laundering, we do have a great primer on illicit finance and how to navigate that. Hey, MC, thanks for the talk. My question is really around hiring. So I have two questions. The first one is, what kind of people do you hire? And then where have you seen success? We live in a world where the experience of yesterday doesn't apply to today. And there's very few people with experience doing this exact thing. So how do you think about it when you hire? And then the second thing is really about you when you decide to join Uniswap. Like you come from a company with a world renowned brand, you know, great 401k, (laughs) health benefits, everything, great pay, strong balance sheet. And then you have like this guy in a t-shirt with a cool logo and 10 people. Like (laughs) what were the few strong conviction points that made you come over? In other words, if I want to hire you in two years, what do I have to do to get there? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Great question. Okay, so the first question on... Uh, who, I may- who do you hire? What do you look for in the profile? Where have you seen success? Yeah, and I'm not sure that we've gotten that perfectly, but we have an amazing, amazing team now. We were 30 people a year ago. We're 100 now. People haven't been there for very long. So I think for the most part, we've, we've done it pretty well. One, it's really important that someone's passionate about our mission. Our company mission is to unlock universal ownership and exchange. So at a very high level, anyone in the world should be able to own things and be able to participate in exchange. And it's important to us that people like care about that, that resonates with them. They can have so many different reasons why that's the case. And then having demonstrated the first principles, like 
whether problem solving or launching something, because you can't really just operate in heuristics and pattern matching in the way that you can in a lot of even tech companies relative to crypto. Where do people come from? Referrals, referrals, referrals have been very, very helpful. To be honest, once we got to a certain stage of like 30 people, then we really leaned on referrals and incentivized people for referrals. One other thing I should mention that is, I think, very important to our company is, and part of what I think has helped us build better products. We're actually 40% women as well, which in crypto is very unusual. And our smart contracts team is actually 50-50 women engineers. I think it just became self-fulfilling in that women who are really passionate about crypto or smart contract engineers were like, oh, this is a place that has more women <laughs> and that made it more compelling and interesting to then work at Uniswap. So I think that's powerful because people who are working there every day can tell the story that many more times and magnify the impact of recruiters. I don't think that any single background is the most important thing. We really don't pay attention to educational background that much. Of the four or five people who built version one, two, and three of the protocol, two of them, we weren't even sure if they went to college. So people can demonstrate their capabilities in other ways. On me, why I decided to join Uniswap. So I'd been obsessed and passionate about crypto since about 2011. I first learned about it when I was in law school. I'd come out of spending three years as an investor at Goldman Sachs in their internal hedge fund during the financial crisis, was like, I want to work toward improving the financial system. That is, when I think about the impact that the internet can have on the world in my lifetime, it seems like in media, it sort of eliminated business models and created a lot of good mixed outcomes. In financial services, if it can reduce costs, create transparency, expand access, that arc should be positive over the course of my lifetime and good for people in the world. And so how and where can I contribute to that? So I was passionate about crypto early on, but for many years, like 2011 to 2018, 19, a lot of crypto was focused on infrastructure or very foundational layers where as someone who's not an engineer, I couldn't be that helpful. I just like couldn't contribute that much. And a friend of mine who'd known that I'd been passionate about blockchain and crypto for a long time joined Uniswap as general counsel. And oh, Marvin. Marvin. I adore Marvin. Marvin and Maury, he's amazing. Yeah. yeah. He'd been an open internet advocate and policy advocate in sort of the early 2000s and 2010s. And then he was general counsel at Protocol Labs. And when he came to Uniswap, he called me and said, this company is incredible. The founder is amazing. You share so much of your sort of vision for the world. The impact is huge. We have no person who has like business experience or operational experience here. And the whole time I've known you, you've said that you are like an entrepreneur by nature. And like everything I did at BlackRock was starting new businesses from zero and scaling them to hundreds of people or zero revenue and scaling it to 100 million plus. And I did that 2.5 times, one time failed. And he was like, since I've known you, you've been passionate about blockchains, said you have an entrepreneurial spirit and you've worked at a big company. So if you're not going to come to Uniswap tomorrow morning, you should just look in the mirror and look at yourself and say, I am a big company person. And I was like, what? <laughs> Man, that was so mean. <laughs> and I spent days with Hayden talking about what he wanted and what he hoped for and how I thought about the sort of potential impact of financial system broadly. Honestly, it wasn't a hard decision. It was really easy. It just was, I had this sort of like longstanding interest. And I think that you'll find that as you're hiring people. There will be people who've been watching crypto, who've been passionate about it, but they haven't found the product or the opportunity or the founder that speaks to them and they think is a fit. Yeah. So the core is having a great company and the tactics is referrals and say, you know, if you don't commit, you're a big company person. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> Guilt them into it. Thanks for sharing. Hi, I'm C. Thanks for the talk. I love the talk. So at the uh, end of 2021, I also trying to look up the uni spot. As, as a female engineer, I'm always the only females in the room, especially in the crypto world. And when I look up Uniswap job dashboard, everyone who work at Uniswap at that time, it's all like miles. So it's kind of scared me away. I didn't apply at that time. And so it's really glad to hear that you guys are emphasized on the diversity and equality at the working space. So my question is around, uh, you mentioned there are three strands for Uniswap. Could you share more about what's the best practice you apply for the commitment to security and also the building the community. Yeah. So first of all, in your first comment on diversity, yes, the team was originally all male, one woman. I think I was like the third woman or something like that. And it was just something that honestly was really important to Hayden. And his view is like, if the point is to build tools for all people, <laughs> then we have to have a diverse team. And I think we're fortunate if you're a small team, a small company, you can do a lot and have a diverse team if you're just thinking about it, honestly. You don't have to 
change a lot of your practices and stuff like that to just like go to a zillion conferences, just focus on it. Okay, so on community and security, two things. One is I think it's a mindset and some of your engineers, right? It's just having engineers who care a lot about security, who think about smart contract code. We did a Crypto Jeopardy game at our last onsite and one of the categories was hacked DeFi protocols. Oh. And most of our smart contract teams could list all these different hacks and why they happened and follow this and think about it intensely all the time. And then the other thing is audits and picking the right auditors. And especially as a new company, sometimes you have a long waiting period before you can have one of the top two, three audit firms audit your smart contracts, but it's worth doing that. And we often have had things audited twice. On that last one, it seems like in DeFi, the packs are often mainly bridges than the core protocol itself. How does that kind of work on the whole yeah. messaging and building side? Because you don't yep. really have control over the bridges. Yep. So the bridges are, it's really scary. Another thing that was really tough for a long time, people in the community would sort of be agitated about why Uniswap wasn't deployed on more chains. And that is a governance decision. The labs team has nothing to do with that. It's voted on through governance. But the community was pretty cautious about supporting deployment to chains that had bridges that basically required a multi-sig or had some limited security capabilities. Yeah, that one's really tough. But I think like security culture meant that for two years, Uniswap wasn't deployed on other chains that uh, SushiSwap, for example, was because part of the principles of the community was to care about security. But there was a hack this past week, unfortunately, Euler, which yeah. I thought very highly of and thought was doing really cool things, was hacked because they integrated an automated piece of code. And so those are my only two pieces of advice. They may sound pretty... Obvious. On community, I think from the very, very beginning, just like talking to everybody at conferences, a couple key conferences about what you're doing. So you get people kind of excited. But then from there, there's a lot of tools to keep community engaged that we don't deploy at all or use at all, like you know, giving things to your users and giving people access to stuff. Honestly, the airdrop is the thing that comes back over and over that people are excited about. So now that there's a lot more thinking around how you can be creative and thoughtful about airdrops and keep people engaged, there are other companies that would have more advanced thinking on that because they did it more recently than we would. Call there. Thank you. Thank you. I, you mentioned earlier that a lot of money is still tied up in TradFi and in thinking about you know, what the systems look like there versus what we're moving forward towards. When you think about strategy, how much of that strategy is geared towards building things for the brave new world versus building things that are a kind of catering to or, or tying back to TradFi and yeah. bringing that over? Yeah, that's kind of what I was trying to get at in the question around sort of like internal navigating things where I might have a perspective that might be different from people, or like early employees of the company. Like Aiden and I completely agree that everything we're doing is for the brave new world. And that's our strategy as a company. We're not spending time sitting with people who are excited about how they could use blockchain technology with TradFi players, helping them explain blockchain technology to them. Because I was the person that everybody pitched at BlackRock for years and years and years until they agreed to partner with Coinbase, like I have an appreciation for how long and hard those things are. And I don't think that's the best use of our time at Uniswap. I also think that DeFi especially is likely to have more consumer-driven adoption. And Hayden and I have different reasons that we thought that, and we've debated how that's going to unfold. No one really knows exactly, but we are entirely building for the brave new world. And then that just means you have to be realistic about how do you anticipate what growth is going to look like. And so that's part of why we've been trying to simplify the consumer experience, make the consumer experience easier so there's just fewer hurdles. Right. And, and at some point, there will be that inflection point where people start to move over in mass. Hopefully. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Hi, I'm Steve. I'm just thinking through how to manage corporate treasuries better. And I'm sure this yeah. is something you've, you're thinking about. You can illuminate what Uniswap does, because I know you guys have a centralized entity that probably pays payroll and rent and things like that, but also have the centralized funds. How do you go about that? How do you think about it? Yes. So we use four different banks and we keep like half of our cash and money market funds or treasuries. So how do we think about, I mean, we just operate under the assumption that it's important to be hard to kill, so to speak. And so you don't want to rely on a single platform. Mm -hmm. That's kind of obvious now, I suppose, after the weekend, everybody felt the pain of relying on a single company, mm -hmm. but that's what I would recommend. So right now, the reason we've shipped most of our cash increasingly into higher yielding, but pretty safe assets like treasuries is obviously because of better treasury management, higher yield. We did do stablecoin lending last year and the year before. But yeah, just use multiple banks. And was, there a, balance sheets. was there a question of whether to allocate some portion of it to like, Bitcoin or ETH or something yes, like that? Yes, 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 yes. So we actually did do that. And not just Bitcoin and ETH. We actually purchased tokens. So when I say we, I mean Uniswap Labs. 
the company that's built all the products that are now on top of the protocol is what we focus on. We also bought a couple other protocols because we wanted to participate in governance. Mm-hmm. We wanted to sort of illustrate and demonstrate as token holders ourselves and other DeFi protocols and support the DeFi ecosystem. Great. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, MC, thank you very much for the talk. I'm curious because you're from a traditional finance background. I've always been thinking the lack of credit lending might be a hurdle for DeFi becoming mainstream adopted. What do you think of that? The lack of lending? The lack of credit lending. So it's all over collateralized. Well, some people have tried to do less collateralized lending protocols and they've had a hard time succeeding so far. I think the hardest part is like typically how you make up for having less collateral is you have more information about your borrower. So there are trade-offs there. If you want very limited information, what information can you get that can help you underwrite something? I generally agree that we have to figure out more reliable and risk-supported ways of doing credit. Hopefully that's something you're working on. <laughs> no, actually I'm working on on-chain game. But yeah, credit lending is always a very interesting space thing as well. There is a connection indirectly with those two because technically your on-chain game reputation, anything you build on-chain is clues into your right. reputation, which can then feed your credit. So they're all connected. Awesome. Well, just to quickly sum up, it sounds like decentralization, building it open, everything is different. There's also more of the same. And hopefully all of you get to the point to be able to hire an MC yourself. (laughs) Thank you so much, MC. We really appreciate you being here today. Thank you for listening to Web3 with A6 and Z. You can find show notes with links to resources, books, or papers discussed, transcripts, and more at a 6 crypto.com. This episode was produced and edited by Sonal Choksi. That's me. The episode was technically edited by our audio editor, Justin Golden. Credit also to Moonshot Design for the art and all thanks to support from a 6 and crypto. To follow more of our work and get updates, resources from us, and from others, be sure to subscribe to our Web3 weekly newsletter. You can find it on our website at a6nzcrypto.com. Thank you for listening and for subscribing. Let's go.